Hello class, this is Mr. Liao and we are going to go over the 2019 micro questions set one. Number one, as the only gas station in a small town, Philip has a local monopoly on the sale of gasoline. Philip is currently earning positive economic profit. A, draw a correctly label graph for Philip and show each of the following. We have the profit maximizing quantity and price, we have the deadweight loss associated with Philip's profit maximizing quantity and the maximum quantity at which Philip would earn zero economic profit. So let's start with parts one and two, quantity on the x-axis, price on the y-axis, demand greater than marginal revenue as is the case for a monopoly. There's MC and ATC. Let's look to see where MR equals MC. You can see that's at QF. Go up to the demand curve to find PF. Deadweight loss is the area that's the loss of efficiency due to not producing the socially optimal quantity. So the socially optimal quantity, I didn't graph here, but it's basically here. It's basically where MC equals demand. That's the profit maximizing quantity. So that purple area is the loss of efficiency due to the monopoly. Finally, part four is QZ. That's the maximum quantity at which fill up under zero economic profit. That's where demand equals ATC. So you can see that's where the price is. Now you can see on my graph, it's where MR equals zero, but that's basically just how my graph ended up. What you wanna focus on is where price and the demand curve equals ATC. Bar B, assume that Phillips fixed costs increase because of a new lease on its property and Phillips stays in business. Will the deadweight loss increase, decrease, or remain unchanged at Phillips profit maximizing quantity? Explain. So the deadweight loss is not going to change because a change in fixed cost doesn't affect marginal cost. Since marginal cost doesn't change and MR is still the same, the quantity of which MR equals MC doesn't change either. So there is no change in deadweight loss. Will Phillips economic profit increase, decrease, or remain unchanged due to the increased fixed cost? Well, in this case, economic profit will decrease. The higher fixed cost will cause ATC to shift upward which in turn will reduce economic profit. So even though it doesn't change the profit maximizing quantity, the overall costs are higher due to the higher fixed cost, which means ATC is also higher, which means at the same quantity, with the price being the same, ATC is gonna be higher, which means there's less profit. C, assume the gas demand decreases because people bike to work more often. What must be true to continue to operate in the short run? This is the shutdown rule. So total revenue has to be greater than total variable cost or price has to be greater than average variable cost at the profit maximizing level of output. So the idea behind the shutdown rule is assuming that the price is still above AVC, any losses will be less than the total fixed cost. The shutdown rule says if the losses, if you produce are greater than the total fixed cost, you're better off shutting down and limiting your losses to the total fixed cost. C2, assume the demand for gas decreases because people bike to work more often. What happens to fill up profit maximizing quantity and price in the short run, assuming the firm continues to operate? So the profit maximizing quantity is going to decrease. Now, because demand decreases, remember the monopoly demand curve is the market's demand curve because the monopoly is the market. So since demand decreases, marginal revenue will also decrease. Since marginal revenue decreases, the price will decrease due to the decrease in demand. So since the quantity decreases due to the lower MR, that means the price is also going to go down because it's going to be at a lower spot on the demand curve. Okay, number two. The following is a table showing Dana's marginal benefit from purchasing bottles of water and good X from a grocery store. Part A. What is Dana's total benefit from purchasing two bottles of water and one unit of good X? Show your work. So notice the table gives you marginal benefit for both water and good X. So to find the total benefit, you'd basically add the marginal benefits together. Notice that they are identical. So for two bottles of water, her total benefit is 24 plus 18 or $42. For one unit of good X, it's the $24. So 42 plus 24 is $66. B, assume the price of a unit of good X is $5. Calculate the total consumer surplus if Dana purchases three units of good X. Show your work. So consumer surplus is the total benefit Dana receives minus the total amount she pays, the total cost. So for the total benefit, it's 24 plus 18 plus 12. 
So $54 of benefit for three units of good X. Since each of those three units costs five bucks a pop, it's gonna be 54 minus 15 or $39 as the consumer surplus. C, now assume the price of a bottle of water is $3 and the price of a unit of good X is $6. Dana spends her entire budget of $30 on bottles of water and good X. CI, explaining why Dana does not maximize her benefit when she purchases two bottles of water and four units of good X. Use marginal analysis to explain your answer. So the rule for utility maximization is that for the last unit purchased, the margin utility for each good divided by the price has to be equal. So the margin utility for water divided by the price of water has to equal the marginal utility for good X divided by the price of good X. Now notice that for two bottles of water, her last marginal utility is $18 divided by the $3 she pays for the water means it's six is the ratio of marginal utility per dollar. For good X, she buys four units. So the fourth unit brings her marginal benefit or marginal utility of $6 divided by the $6 it cost, that leaves a ratio of one. Now notice that the ratios are not the same, so Dana is not maximizing her benefit. So what are the optimal quantities of good X and balls of water at these prices? So Dana is going to buy the products with the highest remaining margin utility per dollar. So she's first gonna buy bottle one and bottle two of water because eight and six are the highest margin utilities per dollar remaining. So that's going to mean she's going to spend six bucks, which means she'll have $24 remaining. Next, she's going to buy a third bottle of water and a first quantity of good X because both of those have a marginal utility per dollar of four. So the water costs three bucks. The good X costs six bucks. That's $9. Now she'll have $15 left. Next, she's going to buy a second unit of good X because that has the highest margin utility for dollar remaining of three. That costs her six bucks, now she has nine dollars left. Finally, she's going to buy a fourth bottle of water and a third unit of good X because both of those have a margin utility per dollar of two. That's gonna exhaust her income. So Dana is gonna purchase three units of good X and four bottles of water as her optimal utility maximization. Part three, suppose the price of a unit of good X drops to $3. Now calculate Dana's cross price elasticity of demand for bottles of water with respect to the price of good X and state whether the two goods are substitutes or complements. All right, so with the new price, Dana is now going to buy five units of water and five units of good X. Notice that the MU per dollar is the same because both give the same marginal benefit per unit for each additional unit and now that they cost the same. So Dana is going to buy 25% more water. So remember the cross price elasticity demand is the change in the quantity of one good, percentage change in quantity of one good divided by the percentage change of price of the other good. So Dana is buying five bottles of water now instead of four. That's an additional 25%. Now you can use the midpoint rule. I didn't use it here just because it's easier to do it this way. Meanwhile, for good X, the price of good X went from $6 to $3. In other words, it went down by 50%. So the cross price elasticity is plus 25% divided by negative 50% for a ratio of negative 0.5. Because the elasticity of cross price coefficient is negative, the goods are complementary goods. Complementary goods means that the cross price elasticity is negative. If the cross price elasticity is positive, that means the goods are substitutes. Number three, Patrick's Pie is currently the only pizzeria in College Town. It can either advertise or not advertise. D's Pizzeria is contemplating whether to enter or stay out of the College Town market. Each pizza establishment independently and simultaneously makes its decision. The payoff matrix above, or below in this case, shows the profits for each combination of decisions and both players have complete information. The first entries in the payoff matrix are Patrick's Profit and the second entries are D's Profit. So part A, what actions maximize the combined total profits for Patrick's Pie and D's Pizzeria? So all you're doing here is looking to see which sum of the numbers within each box is the highest. And as you can see, it's going to be that one. That has the highest total. So the total profit of 175 bucks means that Patrick's Pie is going to advertise and D's Pizzeria is going to stay out. 
B, conditional on your response in part A, does either Patrick's Pie or D's Pizzeria have an incentive to cheat on this combination of actions that maximize the combined total profits? Explain using the numbers from the matrix for each pizzeria. All right, so you, what you want to look at is if each pizzeria cheats, are their profits going to increase? So we're starting here from 175 to zero. So in this case, Patrick's is advertising and D's is staying out. So let's suppose Patrick's cheats and they decide to not advertise instead of advertising. Well, you will see that their profits go down from 175 to 100. So they're not going to cheat. They're not going to not advertise instead of advertising because their profits going to decrease. Meanwhile, for D's Pizzeria, they're choosing to stay out. If they decide to enter, their profits go from zero to negative two. Again, they are worse off. If they cheat so in that case neither firm has a center to cheat because both would be worse off if they cheated on their agreement c does patrick's pie have a dominant strategy so let's take a look if d's enters the market patrick's will choose not to advertise so if d's enter patrick is going to choose the 150 instead of the 50. now d stays out Patrick's is going to advertise because it's going to choose the 175 instead of the 100. So since Patrick's will have a different strategy depending on what D's does, Patrick's pie does not have a dominant strategy. D. Identify the Nash equilibrium or equilibria actions for this game. Now in class we only looked at a Nash equilibrium where basically one side has a dominant strategy and the other side chooses what it does based on the other side's dominant strategy and it stays that way. Now in this case, we know Patrick's doesn't have a dominant strategy. What about D's? Now if Patrick chooses to advertise, D's is gonna stay out because zero is greater than negative two. On the other hand, if Patrick doesn't advertise, D's is gonna want to enter the market instead of staying out. So that means D's doesn't have a dominant strategy either. So neither side has a dominant strategy. Now, what does this mean? The Nash equilibrium again takes place when neither side has incentive to cheat or change its strategy. So we already saw this with the first example in part A or part B. If Patrick's advertises and D stays out, Patrick's profits are 175 and D's profits are zero. Neither side we saw had incentive to cheat. Patrick's is not gonna not advertise because that decreases their profits from 175 to 100. D's is not going to enter because that reduces its profits from zero to negative two. But there is another Nash equilibrium position, and that's where Patrick's doesn't advertise and D's enters. Now, in this case, if Patrick cheats and advertises instead, his profits go from 150 to 50. So he's not going to cheat. Meanwhile, for D's, if D's says we're going to enter and then they change their mind and cheat and stay out, their profits decrease from 15 to zero. So this is another position where neither side has incentive to cheat. These two positions represent the Nash equilibrium actions for the game. Part E, ignoring antitrust considerations. Suppose that Patrick pays D's Pizzeria 20 bucks if D's chooses to stay out. Redraw the matrix, including players' actions and payoffs, showing how Patrick's Pie's payment to D affected the payoffs. So if D stays out, Patrick's going to lose 20 bucks in profits and D is going to increase the profits of 20 bucks. So for the first scenario, Patrick goes from 175 to 155 and D's goes from 0 to 20. In the other scenario, Patrick's goes from 100 to 80 and D's goes from 0 to 20. So these are the two outcomes where Patrick asks D's to stay out and it gives D's 20 bucks of its profits. Part E2, identify the Nash equilibrium for the redrawn matrix. So now D's does have a dominant strategy because regardless of what Patrick does, D's is going to stay out because you notice their profits are 20 bucks and that's going to be higher than D's profits if they enter the market. So D's is going to stay out for sure. Since D's stays out for sure, Patrick's is going to advertise because they'd rather have profits of 155 rather than 80. So the Nash equilibrium is that Patrick's will advertise and D's will stay out. If you have any further questions, you can let me know during office hours or send me an email.